to, to the frontiers of science. So as many of you guys have, are aware, uh, this uh, event comes at a very important time in the college, uh, at the change of the guard. So Dean Henry White uh, will soon uh, complete his term in office and will uh, transfer his duties to a new dean, uh, Peter Trappa, which is the current chair in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. And so during his two terms, uh, Henry has grown this college, has brought a lot of new resources to this institution. And I guess most importantly, at least for me, he uh, got the cell center built and opened and it's in full operational and it's housing uh, research groups from the Department of Physics, Chemistry and Biology and does great research, the kind of research we hope we can excite you tonight. And I have to admit, so the job of a dean is incredibly difficult and uh, I'm always amazed that deans are able to not just prevent absolute chaos because that's usually the trend of most institutions to to go to, but also bring new ideas to foster actually education and research. And so uh, this really should be, we should thank them for this. And so I ask you for some applause for our current Dean Henry and the future Dean Peter. Thank you. <laughs> so the Frontiers of Science lecture series was established in 1967 by the University of Utah physics professor Peter Gibbs. So Kip, uh, Gibbs and his fellow physics faculty invited uh, speakers from all over the country to Utah to discuss the new frontiers in uh, physics research. And, uh, but a larger goal of these lectures was to uh, make them public lectures to draw attention uh, to important new developments in science. And since then, uh, this uh, Frontiers lecture has broadened its topics, so it includes now, as you might have meant, uh, realized, uh, topics from all the different research areas in the college. So the Frontiers lectures have been extremely successful in its mission and hosted 40 Nobel laureates as, as lecturers. So, and it also should be noted that several of these uh, laureates uh, received their Nobel Prize after they gave the lecture here in Utah, <laughs> just suggesting maybe, you know, we, quite some influence here. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> it's a high standard, I know. <laughs> so with that, I would like to introduce Nels Elde, which will, uh, from the Department of Human Genetics, he will introduce our tonight's speaker, and maybe future Nobel Prize winner. So. All right, well, good evening, everyone. And um, first, before I introduce Manu, I wanted to give a shout out to Eric Jorgensen and uh, Becky McKean for really organizing and orchestrating an inspiring day of science today. So many of you were at the um, What is the Big Idea Symposium over in the Crocker Science Center. In the front row, we have Mike Rosen and Jeannie Stoyak, who gave really great talks, uh, setting the, the stage, I think, for tonight's seminar. So could actually, before I begin, can I get a show of hands for people here who are not either enrolled or employed by the University of Utah? Wow. Wonderful. Welcome. Uh, I think you really picked the exact right night to come uh, for a Frontiers of Science Symposium, given our speaker tonight, Manu Prakash. So Manu is an associate professor of bioengineering at Stanford. Is that a community college, by the way, Manu? Or... <laughs> He's indicating it's a four-year university. Is it accredited, actually? Is it, is it, it's accredited? Fo they have a football team? It, they, they do? OK. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Very good. I hadn't heard of it. I hadn't done my homework for this introduction, but it sounds like a pretty prestigious place. Uh, before Manu got there, he was an undergraduate at IIT, the Indian Institute of Technology in Kanpur, uh, majoring in computer science. After that, he did his PhD at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in applied physics, 
From there, he was a junior fellow of the Harvard Society of Fellows studying biophysics. So in academics, we call this the easy road. <laughs> Sorry, Manu. He, by the way, he built a microscope while Marcus was talking. I mean, this is, this is it's really, it's kind of inspiring and depressing at the same time. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So in 2011, Manu opened his laboratory in the Department of Bioengineering at Stanford. And actually, the chair there did a little bit of a bait and switch. So he sent Manu these gorgeous photographs of the new bioengineering building. And when Manu showed up, they were six months away from completing the inside of this place. And so in sort of the Prakash spirit, he actually grabbed two rotation students and traveled the world thinking about how will I open my lab not in the bounds of that building, but thinking about the world around me. And this was a key sort of seed, and I think you'll see this style very, very clearly throughout his talk tonight. And this is uh, in the title, Frugal Science or the Accessibility of Science. And Manu does this like no one else. So he's the co-founder of a company called Foldscope Inc. This is the $1 microscope that I'm sure many of you have heard about. What you may not have heard is that there are 750,000 of these things now deployed from Thailand to Texas. And so this is, I think, a potential revolution in the way kids from around the world are gaining access to science and something that is uh, unparalleled. I have to, on a personal note, thank Manu for this. So just a week ago, I was in Texas in the Hill Country. And in parts because of his work with the Foldscope, this $1 microscope, I had a conversation with a 10-year-old kid, uh, Logan, who's a homeschooler about an hour west of Austin, and he was asking me about looking at ciliates and watching their behavior because he now has a fold scope. And I can't even imagine having that conversation if it wasn't for Manu and to think about or to dream about what this means for bringing science uh, to the greater public uh, as we'll see tonight. So we talk a lot these days about multidisciplinary research and of course sort of Manu's work checks all those boxes. I think what's really special about this including in addition to the accessibility, is the brilliance and the curiosity driven aspects of the science. And so on a more selfish note, and for all of us tonight, uh, what Manu does, which I think is really unusual, is to pull out that curiosity from all of us. So if we're scientists who've spent a lot of years kind of weighed down in some sense by the business of science, or if we're non-scientists where science can feel like a new language or a really hard subject that's not accessible, I would recommend that we all, as Manu comes up, just close our eyes for a second and then open them again as an eight or 10 year old boy or girl where it's the curiosity that's forward and join Manu on an exploration of frugal science tonight. Thanks so much, Manu. Thank you. Uh, I mean, Nell's words are, uh, they're remarkable, and I'm speechless. <laughs> uh, but thank you so much for having me. Um, I have been wanting to come to Utah for a while. I was talking to a few friends. I have some really dear friends here. And so thank you so much for making that happen. And thank you all for actually coming here today. Um, I'm going to try to do something very informal. I have 100 or so slides. And I don't want us to be here till 8 or something. Uh, but at that same time, if you have a question or something, just raise your hand and we can have a conversation along the way. And then in the very end, we will save some time for really having a little bit of a discussion about uh, what uh, I'm trying to share today. Uh, and I think if there is any one message, uh, which is, you know, I'm a kid and many times I make these tools for myself and I'm thinking about as a kid, what would I have liked to have when I was growing up? And so most often, although you will see this as a reflection of sharing these tools with many other people, when you walk away from here, I really want you to also think about uh, what comes next. And I want to spend a little bit of time in the very end of what comes next. But let me just share with you what we've been up to for the last couple of years. Um, so first of all, to begin, because I don't end up uh, Oh, yeah, that might actually be better. Uh, 
speech volume program. Okay, let me not touch this. Okay. Uh, <laughs> while Eric is figuring that out, I don't do this work alone. And what is remarkable about starting a lab is that suddenly incredible individuals come along and share your passion and vision. And so, of course, uh, this is uh, the uh, credit slide in some sense. This is what our lab looks like. If the one thing that you take away from that sketch is uh, we're a scatterbrain, uh, we're all over the place, uh, but then at that same time, also the work is not done by cartoons, they're real people. Uh, and I will talk about several of these individuals as I go along uh, in terms of sort of the journey that I have had. Unfortunately, the two kids that I did take to Thailand and India didn't end up joining my lab. <laughs> Uh, but that had to do with that we ended up in Thailand in a rainforest that was infested with leeches. And I got fascinated by leeches, but uh, they didn't have a good time. <laughs> but other than that part, they absolutely loved uh, the lab. <laughs> or I would like to think that. Uh, but you know, it's, it's very important to think about how things begin because the seminar was really about uh, you know, sharing where ideas come from. I'm going to share a little bit of a challenge before I begin sharing some of the ideas because I want you to just also share with me the challenge that we face today. You know, what is the world like today? Just outside this room, outside this university, what, is, what does the world feel like from a scientific context? And then we will dive in into a couple of things that we've been thinking about. Okay, so. Why do I use the word frugal science? It's very simple if you were to just think about this single plot right here. Scientific capabilities come at a cost. And most often as scientists, we're really thinking hard about performance. But at that same time, if you care about scaling ideas, you really have to gear shift somehow. Because it's not just about that one person having the capacity to make the discovery, uh, but literally, how do all of us make discoveries? So this is really the juxtaposition of what I call frugal science. And then the other aspect is if I, you know, Nels mentioned ciliates. Any of you could pull out your phone and search ciliates, and you will get these gorgeous images of monsters, like incredible monsters that are kind of scary but really cute. And you might go away home thinking, I know ciliates. But the very first time you see a living cell, maybe your own cell, uh, maybe somebody else's cell, maybe something that you picked up under your shoe. The idea of experience of science is so influential in how we do science. Uh, when I started my lab, this is really what was bothering me. That of course, with the internet, we get the knowledge shared and the information shared, but how do we share that experience? And could that help in any way the divide that we feel between science and society? Uh, so, I'm going to now share with you the places that I have traveled around the world for the last uh, 10, 15 years. This is a picture I took in Ghana. Uh, this is supposedly a hospital. It looks like a bus stop because it is a bus stop. And that van right there comes once a week with a doctor. Many of these kids that are waiting possibly have malaria. Uh, they have a deadly form of malaria. This is Plasmodium falciparum. You have a week or so to identify this. And at that same time, if you thought that, oh, this is a picture that I took, you look at the statistics, out of the 7 billion people in our world, 1 billion or so still live with no access to roads or electricity, and hence no traditional health care, and no traditional educational system. And that should bother all of us, because in the end, uh, many of the poverty traps are based on uh, some of these sets of challenges, especially health challenges. Now, uh, this is another field site that we work in. This is our field site in Madagascar. I'll show this over and over again. And I pulled out this paper, a very recent paper. It plots every single primary healthcare center in Africa. And I'm choosing Africa, and later on I'll talk about, you know, it's really not about one continent or one location or one place at all. These sets of problems are very global if you talk about affordability of healthcare here. Uh, one of the challenges here is that less than one-fourth of the countries actually in Africa currently from the statistics uh, have any hospital within a margin of two hours for an emergency service, which is the WHO mandate. And the field site that I work in and 70% of the people at a place like Madagascar, I have to walk around 12 hours from here. And it might look like I could go on a bike, but after this it really becomes mountains and 
you can understand the challenge that if your child was sick, what would you do? How would you carry somebody on your back bringing them out to a primary hospital? And no wonder nobody shows up at the hospital. Most of the time when I go to Madagascar, one of the challenges that I face is people, this idea that you, know, you go to the hospital to die because the next person you knew who went there actually died because they arrived too late. So you have to really think about access much more broadly. Um, and now here's another picture just in the context of malaria itself. Uh, one of the challenges that we ask ourselves is uh, for a disease that's been around so much, and I'm emphasizing malaria because I'll talk a little bit about, more about malaria and then switch to many other topics. Uh, ironically, I find this surprising. With all the efforts that we have put so far, I want to state this as you know, infectious diseases sometimes don't get the kind of uh, attention sometimes they need. At this moment, malaria cases are rising. We live in a world where we have invested a ton of efforts, but at this moment, the malaria, number of malaria cases, which is around 200 million per year, are rising. Uh, okay, so one of the challenges we will talk about is can you diagnose something in the middle of nowhere? And uh, this is just the data, let me just skip this. So let's talk about education a little bit briefly. This is another picture that I took in Ghana, and again, uh, you know, this could have been literally a high school uh, in East Palo Alto for that matter. When you start thinking about that roofs don't make schools, you know, curiosity makes schools. And if you don't have the tools of curiosity, how do you handle, we're leaving. So I want to have a raise of hands of just sort of kids in this room, just, just so I know. Uh, kids at heart. Uh, okay, now it's everybody. But, you know, I think for the younger generation or something, okay, you know, high school and lower. We are leaving, and I want to be very honest, we are leaving tremendous challenges for you guys. And if you do the statistics of two billion kids on this planet, roughly a billion people, by many of the uh, numerating standards, a billion kids live in a standard what would be defined as poverty. So we're talking about half of the talent of the world that does not even get a chance to participate in the solution phase. And this bothers me a lot. Um, Again, when we ask, and since this is hosted by, uh, uh, you know, we all care deeply about biology and biodiversity, uh, many of you might have seen the study that just came out uh, for the insect population loss, uh, which was done in Europe for a massive amount of biodiversity mass that's being lost. Now I'm going to, this is my depressing set of slides. You know, ocean, everybody's hearing the story of the ocean. Literally, every single time, I go to the ocean and I do a plankton tow, which is a way to pull out a bucket of water, and I do microscopy. Every single time for the last five years, I actually find microplastics in my samples. And sort of, I could have read about it, but then when I actually do this as a challenge and I start thinking about it, uh, it sort of dawns on you this notion of experience. Uh, and then, you know, we don't have to talk about public trust in science because that's a debate that many of you know about. It's a huge challenge. So for just the next hour, when I use the word research, healthcare, and education, I want you to just broaden the perspective of what it might be like, that this research is as important as all the other research that we also do. And many of these things are deeply connected, which I'll talk about. OK, so what's the big idea? We live on a planet that's fairly large. People are distributed. And we really have to think about planetary scale measurement tools. We just don't have planetary scale measurement tools that are associated with people. And one of the contexts that comes from here is whether it's environment, whether it's healthcare, whether it's education, everybody should have a right to engage in science. You know, whether you practice science or whether you get paid for science is completely different. I mean, that's sort of the vision that we think about. The other aspect of this is how do you make an environment that's inclusive enough that Many of the professional scientists and many of the amateurs that are truly the eyes and the ears of our ecosystems have a chance to have a say. How do you build that? And then again, how do you really build local capacity where you don't have to imagine only to come to University of Utah to actually contribute to understanding the problems that are happening around our neighborhoods. Um, and I want to choose an example to illustrate that something like this, it's not a completely new idea. And here is the quiz number one for today. Uh, can you tell me what that object is? Anybody? Sputnik. How many of you saw Sputnik when it was going up? 
Wow, so that's amazing because yours is the generation that when I aspire and when I think about what happened, I only dream about that scenario. Something very special happened at that time. When Sputnik was launched, as a country, we did not have the means to track satellites. And this is the head of the Smithsonian where the title of the newspaper read, Reds launch dogs in space. It was like, should we trust them? Should we not trust them? What is going on? You have a satellite in space, but that's in the news. How do I know whether there is a satellite in space? One of the things that was started, which it happens to be called Operation Moonwatch, it started right before Sputnik was actually launched in preparation. The largest citizen science program that has ever been run in the country, even till today. And one of the contexts of that was, mic uh, telescopes were shipped. I'm, I love microscopes, so you see I'm s slipping down there. <laughs> telescopes were shipped. It's actually funny that many of these people are looking down. Uh, you might be puzzled. There is a mirror down there that actually looks at a point in the sky. And not just the United States. People around the world were either told how to build these specific microscopes or told how to see the sky. And they're actually collecting data. They're sitting in a row here because they're watching a specific section of the sky. And if an object comes in and goes, they click in and out, and then the next person catches it. They Morse code that data to a computer, IBM computer at that time, that crunches the numbers and gives them the location. It does the trajectory dynamics and says, tomorrow you should look here. And a man in Iowa at that time actually first saw Sputnik. And that was reported, many of the things showed up. And one of the things I love about here is Mrs. Lloyd Eisenhower, housewife volunteer, saw Sputnik too. You know, just <laughs> such an important event in the history of technology and people were engaged. And no wonder people were fired up about technology. You know, how do you do that? We don't need another red scare to do that. We have plenty of scares already, so we should just gear up. Uh, by the way, this is available on eBay, uh, but I don't trust whether it's authentic. So, you know. Okay, so let's switch back to healthcare. You know, when I think about this challenge, many times I'm told, you know, do we have the, we don't have the human capital, we don't have the talent. And I really beg to differ on this because we make tools, but as you'll see very quickly, we make tools for humans to enable their capabilities and capacity. Uh, this is Alicia at the Last Mile Health. Uh, how many of you heard of uh, Ebola? How many of you felt that you were deeply affected by Ebola? Or did you know somebody? So the reason that is the case that so few hands rise up is because of people like Alicia. Because she was on the front line with a dinghy, a backpack, deciding to go in a place that actually has Ebola and actually run tests to see whether we can contain this infectious disease. Just an incredible amount of talent in these community health workers. And many of the people that we work with are barely high school students. They have never gone to even high school, but they're incredible in what they have learned with the experiences. So this backpack is what you should be thinking about the kinds of solutions that I'll talk about. Uh, another example, uh, this is uh, Alex in Uganda, and he had four years of microbiology training. I arrived at this field site, and I asked him, where is your lab? You know, you're a lab tech. He said, you're seeing, you're sitting in my lab. These two beds when I don't have a patient is my lab. And you can see, here's talent that's sitting there but just does not have the means to execute. So I don't buy the argument that we don't have the human capital. Okay, so let's start with a sort of now a little bit of a positive story. Uh, this is going to be my first demo, and I'm going to use Jenna as a little guinea pig. I didn't tell her this before, but since she chose to sit right in the front. Uh, uh, here's a piece of scotch tape. Everybody has played with scotch tape. And I'm going to ask you to just listen to the sound that you hear. And I'm going to do something that you all do every single day, which is pull a scotch tape at maybe you know a centimeter, a second or so. And so you heard that sound. I just expose you to x-rays. And uh, I, I apologize, but I'm assuming you have exposed yourself to x-rays playing scotch tape. Uh, now, why do I call it frugal science? Here is a mundane object that we have had under our nose for God knows 100 years or so. Uh, 1939, Harvey actually first reported in a kind of a shady unknown journal called Science, uh, <laughs> the luminescence of adhesive tape. And he said that there are x-rays generated by a piece of scotch tape. And then 
actually powerfully enough, nobody listened to him, as usually that happens. And then almost 30, 40 years pass, and then in 2003 or 5, Putterman's lab at UCLA actually demonstrated it's enough from an energy perspective to actually take a human x-ray. And now there is a company building a mechanical x-ray machine that does not require high voltages. So you can start thinking, and again, if you ask a physicist or anybody, we don't know how it works. And that's why it's fascinating. I mean, tribal luminescence, there are many ideas, but to really pinpoint, to say this material is going to generate this type of a, uh, output current, nobody knows. But the fascinating thing is that we have ideas sitting our, under our noses if you constrain yourself. Really think about the constraints. So if you care about x-rays and you said, OK, I'm going to build it out of a certain cost, you really have to think outside the box. And many of the several examples I'll talk about I have enjoyed that as a flavor. It's an intellectual curiosity. I actually enjoy it, and I strongly believe this has value from the perspective of just basic science itself. So I like this example because it's, it's delightful. You can go back home in the night in a dark room. You'll actually see photons being emitted by our scotch tape. OK, so as Nell said, uh, this was that early trip uh, but then, you know, we've continued our time. And one of the things that I like about several of the people that I've met, I've learned a lot from them. And one time doing a demo, I had a gentleman who had been teaching microscopy for the last 30 years. He said, ah, I get it. What you're trying to do is diagnostics under a tree. And I like that. I think in general, just doing science under a tree. So that's the perspective. For just today, right now, put yourself in a situation where you got no plug points to plug in. You're in a beautiful environment in the middle of nowhere in Utah but you want to do science. How do you go about doing that? Uh, there is a, this is the menu for today. There are lots of things that we have worked on. I might skip some of these things, jump back and forth, and if you have questions, we might end up talking quite a little about it. Uh, but the context will be is we will now walk through a few sets of solutions that I've had the chance to build, and in the very end, we'll talk about Foldscope, which is a solution that we've actually scaled up, and we have a long way to go. OK, so let's start with Uganda in 2013. Uh, at that same trip when I was visiting, uh, I went to a clinic, and the clinic looked something like that, a little better under that tree. And one of the things I noticed at that time was there was a really nice centrifuge being used as a doorstop. And how many of you have used the centrifuge? Plenty of you, so you know it cost money, you know, like $1,000. It was very nice. It had a cable sitting there, and I found it puzzling. I asked my interpreter very politely, I, you know, why are you doing that? Uh, and he said, you know, we haven't had electricity for five years. There used to be a line. There is no line. So this is like, this is just a piece of rock for me. Uh, and it occurred at that time, you know, centrifugation as such a powerful tool that we all use both in basic science and analysis of samples and diagnostics is so dependent on power. And on the flight coming back, you know, I love toys. I have lots of toys that I've grown with. And you know, I kind of, my mind drifted towards thinking about spinning toys. And I got back to the lab, and we bought all the spinning toys, you see where this is going, that I could find in a toy store. So here is the next quiz. I want you to guess how fast does a yo-yo spin? So I happened to have had a circus artist at that time who had spent a lot of time throwing yo-yos. This is a very good throw. Can you tell how fast? Uh, you know, what do you think? I'm wondering whether there is volume coming through from the audio, because we're going to need that at some point. And if there was an audio jack, I could connect it. I see the audio jack here. Um, uh, anyway, any guesses? What's the fastest yo-yo throw? Yes, in our rotations per minute. 10k RPM. So that's actually. Uh, uh, it's a little too high a number. It's, uh, the best records are, you know, 5K or something is something that you practice hard. Uh, but, you know, ironically, uh, I hired another postdoc, and he wasn't that great a yo-yo thrower, but he, he was pretty good. And <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't choose my postdocs for their yo-yo skills, <laughs> but it just so happened. Uh, uh, and, but as you know, it's a pretty hard skill. It takes time and effort. And it's fast, but it's not what I was looking for. So we kept searching, and then I had another postdoc. Who we essentially sampled all the spinning objects just to see how fast they spin. And we stumbled upon this toy, 
which is called a button on a string or a whirly gig. How many of you have used this before? I'm going to just play that here. This object. Wow. So the people are showing their age today. It's <laughs> when I am in a, you know, a high school or something, they're all thinking about fidget spinners. and That's not fast. This is fast. Uh, you take an object, you take a button, you take a string, you weave it around, and then I'm essentially coiling this. And then when I pull, you see something spins. And since I already used you as a guinea pig, I'll use you as a guinea pig. You can hear that sound. Uh, now the question is, how fast does something like that spin, right? Um, and if you haven't read my paper, uh, actually, let me backtrack. One important bit here, when we saw this object, uh, we got a little bit curious and we dug a little bit deeper. This happens to be, uh, as far as we know from archaeological papers, the oldest known toy in the history of mankind. Around 5,000 years or so ago, we found relics in Jerusalem, in Alaska, all around the world. In the Greek culture, it was used as a musical instrument, like what you could hear here. Um, and nobody in this entire time actually asked a question, how does this object work? And uh, we got excited. We asked that question. This is how it works. Uh, <laughs> but once you understand it, there's something very powerful. Now, we could change the equations we could understand. I mean, of course, it was discovered in a playful way, but then it was engineered in a way that at this point, we hold the world's record for the fastest spinning object with human power. And we can get this object all the way to 125,000 RPM. So that's going to be equivalent to if you do your ultra centri that's 30,000 G when you're typing in in many of your centrifuges. And you can immediately see, uh, I can separate a needle from a haystack, implying if there's a small density change in the parasite that I'm looking for, rather than searching for it, I can pull it out. That's the principle that we use that to demonstrate. So we turn that into a uh, uh, centrifuge. This is Saad, who now has his own lab in Georgia Tech. Uh, one of the things we can do is in 90 seconds to 120 seconds, we can separate blood plasma from blood. Why is this important? Uh, there are 3 billion or so people that need to be tested for anemia right now. And a simple test for anemia is the ratio of the pure plasma to their packed red blood cell volume. So if I know where this line is for a known volume of blood, I could tell that we need to do further tests. For every pregnant mother, it should be a requirement. Many of the dangerous pregnancies that happen, happen when you have anemia and you go into pregnancy. Uh, the other aspect is many of the enzymatic and immunoprecipitate-based assays require you to have pure plasma. And you, when you put full whole blood, the enzymes that are lysed from that cells actually interfere. And then you get a very low sensitivity and a specificity test. So if you could just do this, take this on a regular RDT, these pregnancy-style tests for many infectious diseases, you could improve them. Now, you can go further. In a couple of minutes, you can actually pull out a single parasite. Malaria, when it's inside a blood cell, changes the cell density a little bit. It's a little lighter. So if there is even a par single parasite in this one microliter of blood, we can actually pull it out. And then we do microscopy to actually detect it. Now, one of the things, the joys of this is to taking these ideas back to the communities. And uh, again, I don't think you can hear the volume. Is there a way to connect to the volume? Um, this was the village chief that we walk 12 hours to get to. And this is where we do our clinical work. Uh, this place has endemic malaria. And I found that fascinating. I mean, A, I could get him to smile, because when we entered the room, uh, I didn't speak Malagasy. Somebody had to translate what I was saying into French. French was translated back to English. Who knows what was going on in that room? But ironically, one of the fascinating things about that room is there's only one single woman in that room, and that happens to be both the teacher and the community health worker. And she's the only woman actually allowed in this room where decisions are made by chiefs. So I found that fascinating, actually very inspiring in that context. And she's the woman that we've been working with in many of our clinical trials from a, a training perspective. The reason I also showed this video for many of the young kids in the audience who think about solutions you know, I have no shame in sharing what we are working on. It doesn't look like a shiny machine or something. 
But it's very valuable if it's the right thing in the right context, you really have to share. And sometimes we're too deeply entrenched and thinking too much. It's very valuable to share our tools openly and just see what happens. Um, this is what a clinical trial looks like, <laughs> just so, yeah? Uh, it's okay, but it's, this also has audio. I do need audio in the very next slide. I can take that out. Uh, awesome. Anyway, if you've never done a clinical trial, this is how clinical trials work. Uh, you know, we're just, uh, we're spinning for malaria, so anyway. Uh, what happened, which is wonderful, when we wrote this paper, uh, literally 30, 40 designs started coming out from the community itself. Uh, now there are several different diagnostic tests that have actually been built on this platform and platforms like this. And what I find the most amusing is there's a cell phone charger now <laughs> that operates on this principle. So uh, it's, you know, this is the beauty of ideas. When you share something, it sparks curiosity and it just creates that sense of a momentum in a space, which is very valuable. I couldn't have predicted something like that. Uh, okay, let me tell you about punch cards. So my quiz number two, uh, I really want to know, how many of you have actually programmed a computer with punch cards? Wow. <laughs> This is amazing. Uh, so how many of you have no clue what programming with punch cards mean? <laughs> I am so sorry. Uh, OK, we will, we will talk about it. Uh, one of the things that we've been thinking about diagnostics is you know, it's a modular set of a process, so could we really build modular diagnostics? And I'll just go back to the history of this. Uh, in 2011 or so, my wife, uh, who was at that time a postdoc in Tim Mitchison's lab, it, uh, got me a white elephant gift. She thought she would like that. And actually, this is literally the same object that she gave me. Uh, as a, She stole it from somebody in this white elephant Christmas present. And she said, I thought you would like it. I did actually like it. I liked it a lot. And something occurred uh, when I started thinking about it. Everybody knows what a music box is. Yes, you have played with this thing. You put in a tape. And I couldn't find my tape, but if I was to play it, I could play happy birthday to you, for example. The code tells when these little strings would play. They would hit these little metal wires, and you hear something. Now, I mean, that's interesting. That's programming music, which has been around for hundreds of years. Uh, one of the challenges in thinking about diagnostics out in the field is you know, they look simple on a chip, but they're pretty complicated. They require a whole lab. Or they look very simple, but they can't do that much complexity of the assays the biochemical assays you would like to do. And historically, one of the things that I find fascinating, the very first textiles were all programmed by the Jacquard Loom, who invented punch card tapes. This painting is the very first digital painting made in the world. It was a painting gifted to Jacquard with 24,000 punch cards that were used to program it in the year 1802. When I zoom in, you actually see the bits, and you actually see the punch code right there. Now, a very famous man, Charles Babbage, saw this painting. Charles Babbage is known as the inventor of the analytical machines, very first mechanical computers. And he realized that there is a connection between programming and these objects. And the ver this happens to be add, subtract, multiply, whole. When um, Babbage died, this was found in Turin. This happens to be the very first program ever written in a piece of paper with punched holes. And one of the things that we realized in the lab was if you could do music with this, you could do textiles with it, you could do programs with it, can you do chemistry? And that's exactly what we did. Uh, here is, I'm not going to go into the details of this. Here is actually an assay that I'll talk about for malaria where the protocol is encoded. So all the pipetting steps that you would take are just encoded in where these holes are. You can do nanoliter scale reactions. There's a little chip that mounts up here, which does the assay for you for all five species of malaria. This is what I call the graveyard of, uh, uh, graveyard of science and technology. Uh, we started somewhere here. This is what the current version looks like. And we can do many of these things. So actually, this is the actual protocol for malaria. Uh, this is what the chip looks like. And these are all five species of malaria detected on a single card. At this point, the cost of this entire assay is roughly around 50 cents. But all of that is in the lab right now. So we have a lot of work to do. Uh, the reason I'm mentioning this, for many of you who do biochemistry and molecular biology, 
wouldn't it be wonderful if all of us could manipulate molecules? And so this is sort of just barely an idea. I'm just teasing you here a little bit. What would it mean if any kid in the world could mix the two sumo molecules and actually study phase separation, but not use a giant vat for it so it doesn't cost that much to the teacher? So this is something that we're thinking about, both in the context of diagnostics and you know, bringing molecules to people. Uh, so let me switch to another story, and then I'm going to talk back about microscopes. Uh, mosquitoes. Uh, how many of you have experienced living in a place where you were literally eaten by a mosquito, or you felt that way? OK, all of you. So uh, you know the experience. The challenge is, when you think about ecologically, there is just so many mosquitoes out there. And everybody has heard of Zika. The time when Zika hit, when it boomed in Brazil and Latin America, we didn't know which mosquito was transmitting it. Which is a real challenge if you think about 40 countries, millions of people infected, and we can't even tell which mosquito is the primary transmission mechanism. The Brazilian army went out and deployed all many of their staff out there collecting mosquitoes. And for the first six months, how many mosquitoes did you think they caught that were positive of Zika virus? Any guesses? Yeah. 15. No, you're very close. Four. <laughs> For an entire country, so many people infected, and you can see it's an undersampling problem. We just know so little about the ecology of these both pathogens and mosquitoes. And again, I'm talking about planetary scale uh, because they're distributed. Uh, there are 3,500 species of mosquitoes. 40 of them actually carry pathogens that are dangerous for humans. And every year, we cut forests new viruses jump off from different hosts and actually start biting humans. So it's a huge challenge for the future in terms of this transmission. And this is really the key for stopping some of that transmission. I love this map because here is a predicted mathematical map for where Aedes aegypti, one of the scary mosquitoes that spread all across the world, carries dengue, many other diseases. Here's the predicted map. When you look at the number of data points that went in into plotting this entire thing of Africa, only 575 data points. And in another paper, I found this line that I absolutely love, is that these sets of maps uh, are not where the mosquitoes are. These are essentially the distribution of entomologists around the world. <laughs> of course, you find something where you live. And if you have such an undersampled problem, how are you going to ever be able to correlate? And you can extrapolate as much as you want. Does it predict? And again, talking about climate change, there's a lot of work thinking about how would this dynamics change. So, how do you really do this at scale? We started thinking about that. I call it the mosquito bucket challenge. Uh, many of you participated in the ice bucket. This is not a fake photo. It's a real photo from a researcher in Australia. Here is your bucket. It has maybe around between 10 to 15,000 mosquitoes that were collected around. And he has a forcep right there because he's about to pick one of these, put it under a microscope, tell what species, write that down, and do this over and over again. You can see. <laughs> and, and that trip in Thailand, was the first moment I saw this. And it was just like a light bulb, like, wow, this is exactly what Ronald Ross was doing more than 100 years ago. What do we do? Uh, we started thinking about this, and we've been working on several sets of challenges. I'll just tell you about this one idea we call Shazam for mosquitoes. Uh, I was going to pull out my phone, but this is what I do before this sort of a thing. When you're looking for human biting mosquitoes, this is actually really unethical in some sense. You roll up your sleeves. I've done this many times. You look for a mosquito that's going to land on you, and you suck and catch it. And then you do detection on it, which is dangerous because you can get the pathogen. Um, now, one of the things that there are several ideas that we're working on in scaling ecology, but I'm just going to tell you one, which is it says intermission. It's supposed to be in the middle of my talk. You can see how slow I'm going. But I want you to just enjoy this for a little bit uh, because I know all of you hate mosquitoes. But for a fraction of a second, I'm hoping that you'll actually like this. Uh, I want you to think what you are listening to, OK? Any guesses? So some of you figured it out. It's mosquitoes. This is an orchestra of 20 mosquitoes playing a tune, and we had too much fun with this. <laughs> so that is available as a ringtone for your cell phone, if any of you please. <laughs> um, but the scientific point why we built that 
is you could hear distinct tones. That's because actually mosquitoes, when they beat their wings, emit sounds that have specific frequencies. And this was actually, I mean, much of the mating rituals of mosquitoes were only described very recently, but the ecological answer is you are mating in flight, you need to figure out where your species is. This is a female mosquito, there is a male. Uh, you can see it's beating faster because it's trying to match the second harmonic for the female with its own wing beat frequency. So there is this game they're playing and the male really has to listen, which is a generally good message. Uh, <laughs> because the female fluctuates its frequencies and they're actually doing this evolutionary test, is the male good enough? And based on that, this is the science behind that if the male catches on with this, then there is paired flight. Now, we, I mean, this has been known for some time and what we sort of realize is, could we use this for surveillance? And the cell phones that you're all carrying in your pocket, mine is in the bag there, if I, you know, imagine a cell phone in my hand, has all the SNR of the mics and the recording equipment and the transmitting equipment to actually record this data. That was our idea. Uh, we took that idea and we built a project that's called a buzz, because Shazam, I would get sued if I used Shazam. Uh, this is the world's largest database of mosquito sounds. This is the top 20 deadly mosquitoes. We traveled around the world collecting this data. And all of this was actually collected with, I call a dumb phone, which is a $15 phone that my graduate student borrowed from uh, somebody that she doesn't know. But we needed this phone because this is not in production now. Uh, but there are five billion of these, quite literally. And what we're trying to build as, and again, your, this phone competes with all your smartphones. They can't, you can't even tell the difference. Because we're not asking for better mics. We're asking for better cameras. So nobody has stopped innovating after on the microphone side. Uh, this is the data so far. We've launched this project only uh, three or four months ago. People around the world collect this data. They send it to our system. Each one of these dots are actually our collaborators that are doing large-scale surveillance with a tool like that. This is, again, a picture from Madagascar. This is how kids get excited when you teach them about uh, biology. And you know, I often wonder this, this whole thing about, oh, kids are not excited about science. I don't buy that at all. You know, here, we've done this so many times that it's just the energy that comes. I think much of what we do, we feed on much of that energy itself. So we're going to be launching this as an app sometime soon. I'm hoping if you hate mosquitoes, you'll join the project to do the world's largest real-time mosquito species surveillance. Uh, okay, I'm going to switch and talk about microscopy, uh, and uh, we'll see how much time I have. I'm going to go fast. Uh, okay, so microscopy. Here is the history of microscopy in 30 seconds. You can see these beautiful objects being evolved over time by humans. My favorite microscope is coming soon, right there. Uh, I mean, these are objects of craft. It's just incredibly built. I was in Thailand on that same trip in a Venom Institute, an Arabes Institute. I was out in the field, and I saw this Nikon fluorescence microscope out in the field because it's used actually for rabies detection in the middle of nowhere. And it just did not make sense to me because the price of that object was five times the annual salary of the person that was in charge. You know, how these things that we use now are not really built for being able to use in the middle of nowhere with no power, no electricity. We started thinking about microscopy deeply at that time. Uh, that's when we came up with Foldscope. Uh, the idea was very simple. We thought, could we build a microscope for less than a dollar? And uh, we didn't know how we would do it. And that's an important aspect in this design principle. Because if you change it by an order of magnitude, several orders of magnitude of people can't afford it. This is the object that actually exists in the world now. And the only reason we could do it is right here. We figured out some really fun tricks on micro-optics and really to do analytical solutions for micro-optics. We figured out many ways of making micro-lenses. We use paper primarily because it's waterproof. You know, I can do all kinds of things with it. It's pretty robust. Uh, but we use origami to get the tolerances right. So there are these sets of folds. You get it as a kit. You build it yourself. And one of the fun things, I mean, this is the data that comes out of it. These are the ciliates. This is literally data collected by someone in the field. These are the monsters. This one, I know, was actually sitting on the dining table uh, because it was found in a flower pot for somebody who would ignore the flowers for a little bit. Flower pots are an incredible biodiversity uh, hotspot. So <laughs> if 
you love your flowers, just look in what is in them. Uh, one of the things that we did, I mean, there's a lot of published work on the diagnostic side, but I want to talk a little bit about the social side of the story because much of that is published. We've used these for several types of diseases, and many of our collaborators are working on implementing many applications on top of them. It's very important when we built this tool that it does not require another tool like a cell phone. So it's an independent microscope. So at this point, if I stop ignoring you, I'm actually imaging. And then I can come back and pay attention to you and then go back, which is very important because you know, not all the kids are walking around with these screens in their hands, which is a good thing in my mind. Uh, uh, one of the things that we do is take these tools outside. And since I'm really running out of time, I'll, I'm going to skip some of this because uh, these are some of the diagnostics applications. Let me just go straight to what I want. There are several other microscopes we're about to release, uh, which are higher. We call it the big brothers of Foldscope. This is another one which we call Octopi. Now this is fully autonomous. And the big thing that we have done very recently is demonstrated that this in the field can do automated detection of malaria uh, at very close to the kinds of molecular tests that are out there. But I want to skip this because I want to tell you about the, we can also do TB with the same tool. And the way we'll be releasing this would be these are, that instrument costs us roughly around $100 to build. And so you can see there is a cost. Uh, and, but they will be in a network form. But I'm going to skip that. And I can talk about that in a QA. and uh, a OK, let me mention one thing about the ocean. If you come to my talk tomorrow, I will talk a lot more about the ocean. And the same sets of challenges that we are facing on land, we're also facing in the ocean. Anybody knows what this object is? Bodhi, the McBody face, or something like that. That's correct. This is the David Attenborough research vessel now. Uh, these are the types of ships that go out to do research out in the ocean. And one of the challenges about in the ocean is that it costs around $100,000 per day to run this thing for all the fuel and everything involved. So when I write my NSF grant, I have to pay for it for a week, which is pretty challenging, you can imagine. I mean, this is why the ocean is really so unexplored, is the cost barrier. You, know, you can't just jump, go in and open the door and start exploring. We started thinking about this, and we made a realization. Between 10 to 15,000 sailors on their own are out in the ocean at this very moment. And they're traveling. They, they don't like people, actually, I, I believe so. <laughs> they will spend nine to 10 months, uh, years out in the ocean. They do weird places. Uh, we've been working with them to really outfit them and their boats to be able to do both microscopy in the field. And then we collect data from them. And then we do correlative sequencing on that. And that project is called Plankton Planet. Uh, OK, I'm going to just skip yeah. this. And uh, because I do want to keep some time for questions, and I want to end with this. Anyway, this is what that tool looks like. Again, another instrument that's completely modular. You break this apart, costs roughly around $100. But this is a flow-through instrument. So this could image a billion cells if you just keep it on and running. So you should think of it as a merge between flow cytometry and microscopy. OK, let me get back to the social side, which is very important. When we wrote this paper, and many of you have had this experience when you write papers, is you wake up the next day. Uh, it was published, and maybe I don't even remember now. Uh, and I woke up, and nothing in the world had changed. And as at least the one-third academics in this room know what I'm talking about. You know, you think there is something there. People, you know, something should change, and nothing changes. And this is also the unfortunate part that where we have to step out of our bounds if we want change to happen in our communities and societies we care about. And in a really a wacky thought, like in the spirit of, hey, what's the big idea? I believe that was my moment of my whatever idea I had was not the microscope. I told, I went to the lab, and especially the graduate student who's been working with me, the paper is published. I congratulated him, and I said, Jim, if we believe we can build this for a dollar or a dollar or so, why don't we ship a 50,000 of them to people around the world? And he looked at me for a little bit. He was like, what? Uh, and I mean, as a character he is, he took on that challenge. And literally in the lab, we decided to build 50,000 of them. Because I wasn't sure what the world would do if you have a capability like that, especially a powerful capability that can be shipped and shared. And what we realized at that time only after we did this, we were not making microscopes. And I don't believe that's the most creative thing here. We're actually building scientific communities. And 
I truly believe that these are scientific communities, and I'll tell you in a second why. Uh, those 50,000 I posted on my lab website, a little blurb. I got 75,000 emails. We shipped 50,000 instruments for the first 50,000 emails. And I'm wondering, did anybody in this room receive phase one full scope? I'm curious. OK, email right there. Which I, I really get a joy out of it, because you guys were the first pioneers. And uh, many times, it's very valuable. What happened in that first phase really shaped what we do. Uh, this is what the lab looked like. Uh, uh, I often say we, uh, we turned into robots building these microscopes. But no, we made robots that made the microscopes. Uh, and this is what it did. It created a community. And we didn't ask anybody anything unless just one thing. You have to document and share openly what you do. That's it. There was a website where you could go and write a story. You could do whatever you want, but share what you do. That was the only criteria. This is the evolution. This is my very first full scope. I don't know if you can recognize that object. Do you know what that is? It's a matchbox. So just uh, you know, laying out our babies as they are. Uh, but it's evolved into a powerful tool now. This was literally an afternoon of hacking to get, get the concept of, OK, we can actually do something like this. Uh, this is the current state. Uh, they are in 140 or so countries. This picture is actually very, very old. I'll share one or two examples of what communities are doing. Around this next, this coming summer, we'll cross a million instruments. Uh, at this point, it's the largest microscopy community in the world, uh, amateur microscopy community in the world. It might also be the largest microscopy community in the world. Uh, but this is what uh, it does to people. <laughs> Can you lower the volume just a little bit? Because I'm going to talk through. So that's a slum in Mumbai. Uh, it connects to your phone so you can record, but you don't need this to actually experience that. Um, and I'm just going to show you the kind of data that you collect. You take it where you are. You do microscopy as you normally do. Maggots are quite beautiful. Uh, can you lower the volume just a little bit more? You already just saw that data. So we built many instruments. The best instrument is around 700 nanometer resolution. The one that we ship right now is around 1.9 micron resolution. You know, you're literally in the wonderland of the microscopic world. And most of the time, can anybody identify what that object is? Yeah? Uh, the hint is glass houses. These guys live in a glass house. Those are diatoms. Uh, this is all data collect. Anybody knows what that is? Yeah, radiolara from the ocean. A cell that has pokey whatever coming out of them. <laughs> uh, this is all data from the community shared on an open online platform. Uh, One-eyed monsters that inspired Monster Inc. These are real, by the way, just so for some of you who don't do microscopy, there are one-eyed monsters. That's a beating heart. Cells flowing in in uh, uh, arthropod. Uh, this is a glass krill somebody collected in Panama that likes to headbang. You're going to see right there. <laughs> you know, these might be the first time many of these live behaviors for several of these creatures have ever been recorded. Uh, this is when I got poison ivy on my skin, what my own blisters look like. And uh, that's a starfish larva, actomycin waves, the row waves traveling. This is a proboscis of an aphid sucking in all the juices out of plants and making bubbles. This is actually an unknown nematode. We've been trying to identify this because it happens to have this very symbiotic. That's a spider egg developing. Anyway, this data goes on and on and on. Um, and one of the context of this is who are the people that are collecting this data? And they range from a 99-year-old in Uruguay to a 10-year-old in China and everything in the middle. Um, this is the community now. So what you're watching here is Kaziranga. These are rangers in a national park in India that when I did this workshop, they came with their guns. 
because they protect the, the national park and they put their guns outside and they actually see for the first time what they're trying to protect. Um, this is sandflies in Panama. I'm going to show you one or two versions of this, which let me skip some aspects. Developing ant. Uh, okay, this is Madagascar. You know, kids are incredible. Here was a kid who said, wait a second, I have lice on my head? And this is the first time he imaged blood feeding on his own head. And these are those same kids. You can see they have no shoes, but they have curiosity. You know, curiosity doesn't need, ironically, you know, it's as important as food. Nigeria, Cape Verde, Mexico. And much of this work is done by people. You know, we share the tool, but they come up with what they care about in their community. We have a large program in India. Uh, one of the aspects of that program, and then again, this is my favorite example. This is five miles from the Syrian border. This is a refugee camp in Lebanon. And many of these kids have not been to school for the last seven years. And you'll see they still have the capacity to smile. This is East Palo Alto. So you get the idea. Uh, much of that is documented on this site. Uh, every, anybody can go to this site quite literally. And you can see while I gave this talk, there could have been 10, 30 posts coming from around the world just sharing what people observe. We tell people to write stories, write any format they care about, share it as they please. And this is actually the growth in the community. I actually don't know what happened in April, but it's very exciting, whatever happened. I think it's a network effect of some kind where people felt, and I'm stressing on this because we are sharing this tool as broadly as possible. I mean, the vision is literally we do this always in orders of magnitude. So once the 1 million mark is done, we're going to choose 10 million microscopes. Now, the reason I'm stressing, and in this room especially, is as scientists, we have both an obligation and an opportunity to engage with this broader context. You know, when a, a kid, this literally happened, a kid, a girl, eight-year-old, she posted, she wrote a question, what does glitter look like? And her post actually looked like that. This, was, this is a post from a kid in the United States, and I got really puzzled. I mean, you see, that's hexagons. It actually turned out these are natural crystals that somebody figured out that would be great glitters. Uh, here is a post that comes from a pharmacist who figured out how to use these tools to actually detect fake drugs. Uh, this is a cervical cancer screening tool. This is, I actually diagnosed myself out in the field in Madagascar. I got a, a bad bug that is not worth talking about. Uh, but you can go online and read about it. You can read about my experience of what went through. Uh, many of these instruments, they are translated. We deeply care about people learning in their own languages. People write in their own language. Uh, English is not the only language on the site itself. So any of you who speak weird languages, I would love for you to translate. Uh, and uh, this, you already saw this example in Lebanon. So I'm just going to skip this. I want to end with this one gentleman. This is a story of Mo Pandirajan. Uh, he's right there. Mo wrote to me in 2014 or 15 in Tamil, which is his language. He is from South India in a village in Tamil Nadu. And what he said is, I run this very small school of 20 kids. I read about this. Could you ship me some microscopes? And I liked what he said. I shipped him some. I kept getting those messages. I kept shipping. We built a big program in India, and he was part of that program. And last year, I got an email from him, which is very empowering. Again, it was in Tamil, Google Translate help. It said something like 55,000 kids and 12,000 teachers. And I was puzzled. I thought what he meant was in the last four years, he's trained 12,000 teachers and 55,000 kids. And you know, I was like, uh, do I, how do I believe him? He had the list of every single Foldscope he had, and he had the name of every single teacher that he had trained. I became Facebook friends with him. Uh, and I checked on his Facebook. Every single day, Mo actually runs right there workshops for kids around. At this point, after English, Tamil is the most spoken language, primarily because of him. And you know, when we sent out the first phase of microscopes, we would have never discovered Mo if we were not just thinking about let's let's have people who deeply care about this actually engage with us as scientists. And it's incredible. He travels around the country running workshops and he still runs his small school and you know for me the joy is really both supporting and discovering people like Mo 
who are in the trenches bringing science to the broadest group of people. But at that same time, they don't feel their voice is heard back and they don't have an avenue in engaging scientists directly. So if any of you join that community, when he or any of his students make a post, you can actually say, hey, I have an idea for an experiment. You're actually walking them through not just learning how to make observations, but how to think about the scientific process, which cannot be taught, I believe, from a book. Uh, and you know, this community grows. This is actually Lake Chilica. Uh, and one of the things that at least we care about is a world where every single kid, you know, just imagine what does the world look like if every single kid was actually carrying a microscope in their pocket. And I want to end with this picture, uh, which you know, I think about we can manufacture microscopes. We cannot manufacture mentors. Mentors are sitting in this room. Mentors are sitting in universities around the world. Mentors are people like Mo. And I also like this picture because these parents are not sharing their microscope with their kids. <laughs> which is, you know, I truly mean when you are kids at heart, this is what science should feel like. So uh, thank you very much. And I really apologize for going late. It's, yeah. It's, it's no problem, Manu. It's our <laughs> pleasure. And we will continue the conversation. If you have to go, no problem. But if you want to stay and ask questions, I'll try to dart around with the microphone. Uh, one piece of good news. So Manu has already agreed to an encore performance tomorrow at 2 PM at the Crocker Science Center, room 208. And uh, I'll let Eric stop me. But I think everyone is welcome to that. Plenty of room. So if you've been uh, inspired in some way and have the ability to come tomorrow to hear more stories uh, like this and to explore some of these monsters in more detail, uh, please come by. There might even be a, a small trip at 3 p.m. out into the field. Uh, thunderstorms may be uh, pending. But if you want to join us, for, and again, Eric's almost strangling me now down here. If you want to join the three of us, please do. <laughs> yeah. And I actually uh, have enough fold scopes for anybody who comes. Manu will provide the fold scopes right, and the inspiration. Yeah. And so again, please. I think it's about experience. So if you have time, please come. That's right. Yeah. Questions? Not please everyone ask. at once, please. Yeah. We can only <laughs> Please ask questions. Yes. Uh, yeah, we've been thinking about it, actually. There is another instrument that we are trying to build right now. And one of the things that I often think about this is cost versus performance. The one big thing I'm trying to do is build a dissection microscope that both requires the 3D, but also a way to get in your hands in there. So we're trying to implement a mechanism that could allow you to have dissection needles all integrated. I don't know if you've seen the movie or the story Scissors or... Johnny, that's the direction we're actually going. So anyway, that's just a hint. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the way you should think about this, many of the microscopes that I showed are modular. All the optics we swap around. There's a $1.75 instrument. There is a $10 instrument. There is a $100 instrument. There's a $1,000 instrument. And it's, it's a hodgepodge because many of the people in the community that have graduated now want automated tools. They want more capabilities. And it's natural that we need to uh, have them access to a broader group of tools as well. Yeah. Question here from Sahana Fudness. Yes. Um, is the lens of a fold scope also made of paper? Oh, no. So I think yeah, I didn't stress. To, uh, there is this idea in actually just historically in photography called pinhole imaging. But that doesn't give you the magnification. And so there is an actual glass lens that we make. And one of the context of that is it's all while I was building, when I was sitting right there, uh, there's a little lens that I mounted in here. Uh, and our way of thinking about lenses is lenses are important, but apertures are as important. And the reason we could make so many lenses is we realized the way electronics industry assembles surface-mounted components, we can do the same for optics. So we have these reels of tape that have 10,000 lenses that are pre-built by a robot in them. And then it one at a time actually assembles them, makes the apertures. But they're all glass lenses. And then one of the things that we're now working on, and again, uh, this object is very hackable. So you take this object and you say, hey, I want to improve it. I want to put another lens. You figure out another lens. You think about there are sets of couplers. You cut it open. You change it as you please. Because you know, even if you destroy it, it's like a coffee cup. But it's very important to think about that aspect, because this is why we don't ship 
pre-built microscopes. We want people to have that frustration for a little bit. You know, science has an aha moment only when, again, and the scientists are all nodding because they understand what I mean by that, that the true joy in science is when you figure it out yourself as well. So this is another reason that all the parts are laid out in front of you. In the act of assembly, you really think about what a microscope is. And for that question, you get a full scope. <laughs> <laughs> this was the full scope I was going to give you anyway. Yes. So OK, other you... questions? Yes, you don't get a full scope, but you can ask a question. <laughs> Yes, bit. absolutely. But I went online and tried to buy a foldoscope yes. yesterday. Yes. It cost $40. Yes, yes. So you were looking at the wrong part. Uh, <laughs> there are classroom kits. So the, the way we can ship uh, and scale is uh, for $35, there are 20 foldscopes. And that's that $1.75. And then the reason there is actually a $30, $35 foldscope is actually we use that tool because it has all these other bells and whistles, microfluidics, cell strainers, that actually supports, because it costs us at this point with the whole operation, $1.75 to make the microscope. So every single classroom instrument is actually at zero profit, and so you can't be sustainable. I mean, one of the powerful things we were able to do with this is we took zero VC money in building this entity, primarily because we have a mission of broadening the instruments and the way we scale up the operation is people who would like a little more portable. It's just in a nice fancy box, but you should totally buy the other full scope. It's all the same. Uh, but at that same time, the way we financially support the whole operation and the entire team and all of our nonprofit work is using that instrument. Uh, yes. I want to provoke you again. Uh, you should. Uh, how are people discovering? Are you aware of ways people might be discovering how to make money from the photoscope? Uh, you mean they... starting businesses on yeah. top of it? Exactly. Yeah, so we actually support that. For With the Indian government, we started the very first micro-grant program that I'm aware of. Because we cannot, you know, individually, it's very hard. So we're looking for partners that can scale. So we built this program with the Indian government, which is, uh, it's a micro-grant program. Anybody in the country, and I've been trying to do that in the US for a long while, failing, you know why. Uh, the idea was that anybody can have an idea of what to do with this tool for their community. Actually, in Mongolia, there is a, a person training people how to do pasteurization for milk, camel milk. And he couldn't convince people that it's a good idea to pasteurize your milk because they'd never seen anything small. So he actually runs this business where he uses this as the first step. There are lots of sanitation programs around the world that use this. But on the cost side and the businesses side, there is a kid in Nigeria who actually has a small business of detecting fake currency <laughs> under a microscope. Uh, and we're trying to figure out how to scale up and help these inter inter uh, uh, creative people. Uh, but one of the aspects of the program is anybody can write two paragraphs and say, this is what you would like to do. And uh, that goes to the, the Department of uh, Biotechnology, equivalent of NSF. They ship them not only a full scope, but between 100 to a $500 to play, do something, and then that gets documented on the site. And then based on that, they get to apply for phase two, which is a much larger scale. The next manufacturing plant will actually be in India itself, because now we're starting to think about distributed manufacturing. There are 15 fake full scope entities around the world as well, you know, because it's, and you know, that's what it is. And so that's another way of the answer. But one of the aspects of this is, uh, we could have chosen four or five applications and really poured all our heart and just be building that. But I don't live in Mongolia. I don't live in Nigeria. I don't live in Kansas. I don't understand those markets, those challenges, as deeply as many locally people do. And much of the work that has happened, the big idea that we had is you had to pass the ownership of the idea to other people. That's the only reason this whole program is sustainable. Other than getting tools to people, we don't ask anything in return other than the fact that we want them to be open about what they do. And that is why people get fired up. Like if I told you you could do whatever you want in your community because you're the best person to understand your community, you don't owe me anything, take that and take it in any direction possible. People feel open. I think one aspect of citizen science that people find constraining 
is that scientists sometimes, we are looking for an answer. I'm not looking for an answer. We're just, we want the world to be curious. So this is a blank slate. There is zero experiment that goes in a full scope that we tell people to do. They have to figure that out themselves as well. The site helps. But it's very important to pass the ownership to the person that's engaged. And I think that's been, I'm trying to write something in that context that that's been probably the most powerful thing. So if I fall off a cliff tomorrow, the program will continue. Because there are plenty of people who have absorbed the sets of ideas and are building on top of that. And we're using that same network to then bring other frugal science tools. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, yeah. You will notice, if you go and play back my recording, I never used the word developing world. I gave some examples of it. I consider the world as a world of haves and have-nots. There is no developing and developed world. I grew up in India, and right across the margin, I could see tall buildings and every possible thing that anybody in the world can imagine, a person there can also imagine. We live in a very fractured society. You're absolutely right. Uh, the one thing that I've been trying to do is, the reason I was able to build the India program is because I understand the context of India and we wanted to do a large scale experiment with the government. Now there is a program in Argentina, we're starting a program in Singapore, and we're actually, one of the big things that I'm excited about is starting in states in the US, uh, individual states. And again, but I am not an expert. I didn't grow up here. We have Simons Foundation, Moore Foundation that's looking at the Central Valley in California, uh, Simons is looking at the belt around New York and New Jersey. But one of the things we're really looking for are collaborators that, I mean, Nels and I started talking because of his father's science mill, and then we started training them. And that's really the heart of what we need to do. But again, it cannot be us implementing those programs. So if you know of organizations that engage and have people on the trenches and are deeply interested, I mean, we would do everything to support them. And if you look at the map, actually, an incredible density of full scopes exist in the US. When you look at the uh, density of pop population density in the US and the density of full scopes, it matches. So, yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think when I would go even farther again, but I want people to take ownership of these sets of things. Uh, we don't build curriculums for a very specific reason because we want that creative aspect to remain. Many a times, curriculums are very restricting because you know, it forces you. There are a couple of rules, like rules of fight club. There are a couple of rules of full scope club. So if you guys come tomorrow, I'll show you. If you show a full scope to a kid, you cannot take it back. It's theirs. <laughs> It doesn't work that you showed it and then, oh, look how awesome it was and thank you very much for coming. No. The ownership belongs to them. The fun and the aha moment they will have is when they're eating pizza at home and suddenly nobody's watching and then they do something. And that settles in. I mean, many times we work, run workshops, there is nobody, we want them to just go away and think about this and maybe you leave it on your desk for a week and then suddenly have a brilliant idea. So that's very important. Another rule is uh, when you're thinking about engaging and building the sets of programs, we want people to look at the local context. It's extremely important. Like Even when you're thinking about Utah, for example, and you, you understand the schools, there are subtle points about those programs. These, the reason the India program works is because the person who gets the microgrant gets to decide how they will deploy that locally. And they're, they're empowered to do that rather than here is a template, go run with it. Uh, so that ownership locally is very important. And then on the undergraduates, I mean, we've been running programs at you know, state colleges. I mean, I'm surprised many undergraduates pass through a program in, in biology and they've never seen through a microscope or they've seen through the onion cell, which no offense to the onion cell, but you know what you're about to see. It beats the purpose. And that's, that's a challenge. 
So at this point, uh, the Intro to Biology course at Stanford, Caltech, and Princeton were actually teaching with Foldscope. So before the course starts, all the kids actually get a Foldscope with no other instructions. They figure it out. And in parallel, whatever cell biology they're learning, they do whatever else they want. The only requirement is they document what they do. And that's just peer learning and people teach each other. It's not graded in any way. But it's this experience and knowledge. How do you balance that? So I'm thinking about a program like that for classrooms as well. Uh, but classrooms also have complicated things. So many organizations are engaged at this point. And so if you're interested, I could link you with many people who are implementing the programs. But I don't directly implement those programs. Yeah. Yes? Can you repeat that? Sorry. Yes. Maybe it's a bit personal and maybe technical, but you said you started this whole process by going into, like, just went on a trip around the world <laughs> with your students. How did you get the funding for it? Like, did you not have questions in your mind before? Like, <laughs> can you just share about the whole yeah. journey? Yeah. I mean, that's only part of the story. I grew up in India, and uh, I built my very first cardboard microscope when I was uh, maybe 12. That was made out of a badminton racket, a shuttlecock box, and my brother's eyeglasses. Because I thought <laughs> lenses are all the same. It didn't actually work. My brother got really mad. But you know, I think so one of the aspects of this is, I mean, all of us have experiences in our lives that shape what we do. The only rule that I had when I was starting the lab, and the real reason that we did take up that opportunity, I mean, I travel all the time, but I had said when I was starting the lab that I'm going to spend 50% of my time doing frugal science. That was a decision that I had made before, and all the other brilliant ideas can wait. They really can wait. And again, you know, it's just, we get excited. Ironically, the two papers that I'll talk about tomorrow, which are two discoveries, uh, that uh, a lot of people are excited about were made with a Foldscope when I was in a swamp. I discovered a creature that I got so excited about. I brought it to the lab, I cultured it, and we discovered completely new biology. So it's also a reciprocal. It's not these two separated halves. I do this because I personally also enjoy it as well. And I think the heart of your question, maybe you were a little shy, but I'll state it is like, you know, can you do this in academia? <laughs> and uh, the answer is, you know, you try, and nobody's actually watching, really. I mean, people, <laughs> you think people are watching, but nobody really cares. People are way too busy doing what they're doing. You do what you want to do, and you take the risk of whether it matters or not. And personally, I mean, we didn't get funding for Foldscope until we really almost had the paper ready, and we were scrambling our heads how do we do this? I submitted Gates Foundation grants. This is not being recorded, right? <laughs> over and over again, we got absolutely zero response. And in the last application, out of desperation, I actually snuck in a full scope in a physical grant. <laughs> and I shipped a physical paper grant to them. And I got a call from the program manager the next day. And I mean, so it's, it's not as if we, we don't, you know, you don't have to wait for permission. That's it. I don't think you have to wait for permission. And that's something that maybe we don't teach enough in the context of people that are passing through our labs. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, there are, there are always questions. You can always spend your time doing different things. The value of what you do comes a lot more internally rather than externally. And although we live in an external evaluation system, there are ways to bin it in ways so you do everything else to float the boat while you do this other stuff. Yeah. Okay, we have one la time for one last question. I know um, that Manu, as a father of two twins who are three years old, pulled an all-nighter getting them through a tough evening, so he's running on fumes here. So we'll do one more question. If you can make it tomorrow at 2 p.m., though, I think he'll be hopefully get some sleep tonight yeah, and no, be refreshed. I, I so yes. if you can join us, that'd be great. Yes. So really great talk. So how do you inspire a student to come up with this kind of idea to make new discovery? Because inspiring is infectious. Mm -hmm. So what's your philosophy of inspiration? How do you inspire people? I mean, Especially I think yeah, that's too <laughs> tough a question for a late night. Uh, I, here is the thing.
that picture that I showed, you know, just, just think about this picture just a little more deeply. This is my favorite picture of the last, I mean, I have of those 750,000 users around because of this large community, I mean, there is an enormous database of people playing with this object. This is my favorite picture for we are thinking too hard about how to inspire somebody else. You know, people that engage and are around us, they see what we live and breathe, and we do what we do, and there is an honest, like when I'm full scoping, I am just honest. If you go to my full scope uh, videos, you will see me blabbering all kinds of bullshit even. I, I don't know what it is, but I'm, I'm thinking out loud primarily because I'm happy to share. I think as scientists, this is something that a lot of people are thinking about, or the whole point of this Big Idea Symposium is we don't share the process of science. And when you share your excitement for a discovery and the stress and everything included, it's much more of a true experience. And you know, kids, kids in the audience, they can smell it from a distance. They know when you're into it, and they know when you're, OK, you know, this is fine, but I'd much rather go do something else at this time. So to me, it's about genuine discoveries. It's not about trying to teach them that they need to save the world. There is too much of that where we offload it to say, problem, 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 now go tackle it. The world is on a demise. Although I started my talk that way, because I feel now, because I'm running out of time, I feel that way, and I want to share the bigger picture. But most of the time, we add value to an observation way too quickly. So I think just, just whatever we do in science, if you just replicate, there is nothing different in what you should be doing in a classroom while teaching as what you're doing in a lab, per se. There's, I mean, so it's, it's the same thing. This, you know, the journey of discovery is very much the same. And if you go on the site, you will click on a single person, and you will see 25 posts from them for the last four years. You can watch progress. You can see, oh, I looked at this, and then the post shuts down. Oh, this was interesting, and then I compared it. You watch kids think, and that takes time. So this rush of you know, somebody turning into a scientist immediately, this is why the program has been running for the last seven years, and we continue to run it for the next 100 years, primarily because people take their own time. They are in their own context. You judge too much. I mean, I've been in classrooms in the United States where the kid, I could have done a magic trick. I could have disappeared in front of them, and the kid would not raise their head because he was on his phone doing something. Like, I, trust me, I could have done a magic trick. And it's okay, because who knows what's happening in the rest of that person's lives. So, you know, you wait. And then when he sees his other friend doing something later in the bathroom when they're peeing, it's like, hey, let's put pee on the, this is not being recorded, right? <laughs> I mean, I really mean it. That happens. There is a lot of pee videos, and it's, I no, think you we've get run diagnosed out of, time. of all these. <laughs> Crystals, and there's a lot of diseases you can detect. Anyway, it's, I mean, curiosity doesn't know bounds, and it's valuable for them to experience because that's what they enjoy when they are growing up. So there's no formula, there's nothing. You all are equally capable of this. I invite you to do this. Take it as a challenge. You know, go play with somebody for a little while, learn from it. Nobody's judging. But I think what we do need is that part that we do need more mentors. Because as we scale, the total number of scientists in this world are not enough, and then not enough of us are actually engaged. That can be quantitatively documented. Let's thank Manu again.